Hello and welcome to PFF Fantasy Football Podcast. I'm your host, Ian Hartz, and I am here to review all 10 Sunday afternoon games from, you know, an up and down, week seven. Now, maybe not the most exciting slate, but football is football. No Dwayne McFarlane on this edition of the PFF Fantasy Football Podcast. He's enjoying his time in Nashville. I am still right here breaking down all the action that we just saw. So, as always, going to go through each one of these matchups, list some of the, you know, really cool plays, some of the sheesh moments, some of the injuries, some of the stuff that we should be paying attention to moving forward. I know a lot of you are, you know, glued to your phone, watching Red Zone, all that. So my main goal here is to try to provide more context beyond the box score, snap rates, better balls, nullified touchdowns, things that maybe you didn't catch on. So with that said, let's get started. First up, the Green Bay Packers took down the Washington football team 24 to 10. Green Bay covered as a six point favorite. The under cashed at 48. Aaron Rodgers really had one of his best games of the year. We talked before this game about the struggles he had actually been having as a deep ball passer. Ted last and catchable deep ball rate going into this week. The Packers ranked. I'm not saying they just completely lit up the Washington secondary through the air, but hard to complain too much about 274 yards, three touchdowns, and not a single interception. So first score of the game, fourth down. He was rolling out to his right, went back across his body to Devontae Adams. Truly a special throw. And yeah, really just Aaron Rodgers was the story of the day here. We did have Devontae Adams go for 76 yards and a score. Robert Tunyon and Alan Lazard also caught touchdowns. So wasn't only Devontae Adams, the ball is getting spread around. But again, story of the day here was Aaron Rodgers just really being more like the 2020 version of Aaron Rodgers than I think we have seen from the majority of 2021. On the Washington side of things, it was really just a Terry McLaurin show from start to finish. 12 targets, caught seven of them for 122 yards and a score. I mean, the touchdown on 40 yards on the first drive of the game, he really just showed those ball skills. Double digit catches already this year that were contested, thrown at least 20 yards downfield. This dude is truly making one great play after another. And there just isn't anything McLaurin like is incapable of doing. If you want to call him a yak specialist, a contested catch artist, whatever it is, he's just an alpha number one receiver. So great job from Terry McLaurin. He did have one negative moment. And, you know, these uh, helicopters I like to send out on Twitter, the goal is to get a contrarian DFS tournament play. And we won 100 yards and two touchdowns. You know, feeling good about the Terry McLaurin call, but we almost had the full completion, people, because McLaurin let about a five-yard touchdown bounce right off his helmet. It was a perfect throw by Taylor Heineke. He had to avoid some pressure to get there in the first place. Only mistake of the day from Terry. So we're not going to be too hard on him, but just realize he was a normal play from him away from having two touchdowns in this one. Uh, Another sheesh in this one was Taylor Heineke. So he had a rushing touchdown, but the thing is with quarterbacks, when they rule that they give themselves up or just even begin a slide, they're ruled down exactly there. So Heineke, it wasn't a slide. It was kind of an awkward like roll forward. He scored. He passed the goal line, but they essentially ruled that he was down. He had started to give himself up just before getting across the goal line. So they reset the ball to six inch line, tried to QB sneak it. I thought he got the ball over again, but it looked like on second glance that his knee was down just short of the goal line. So Heineke, he had 95 rushing yards in this one. I mean, this dude is a true true dual threat. Should have, could have, would have had a uh, rushing touchdown on there too uh, with a little bit different officiating. Final, you know, sheesh note in this one, Antonio Gibson, not the worst game by any stretch. 51 yards on 14 carries. Just wasn't a lot there. The one play where there seemed to be a lot there for him though, he only got six yards on it. But man, oh man, if he didn't trip over his offensive lineman's leg, it was basically only him and a safety with a met angle between the end zone so could have been a big chunk for Gibson Uh, unfortunately it was not quickly on these backfields so usually with Dwayne we have our utilization report and he kind of gets into the true nitty-gritty with some of the third down two-minute usage make sure you check out the Wednesday edition of this podcast where we break down all the games and we will have all that goodness ready for you there so I'm just gonna keep it a little more simple overall snap counts with the carries and targets Aaron Jones I know he's disappointing us we haven't seen the huge blow-up game here in a few weeks still dominating usage though 72% snap rate had six carries and five targets for AJ Dillon down 25%, just three carries and two targets. So just kind of a weird game here where the Packers, when they had the ball, they were throwing it a lot. And then the Washington football team was really just able to rack up a ton of plays in their own right, keep the ball a lot. Now, 
get stuffed at the, inside the 10 yard line on you know several occasions and not quite punch the ball across the goal line that's why they only finished with 10 points but either way just preventing you know the true sort of positive exceptional blowout game script that you would expect Aaron Jones to have a big time breakout in so don't worry. Don't panic too much on Aaron Jones. I know we haven't got, not gotten that RB1 production just yet, more weeks than not, but he still has that role that we would expect all sorts of goodness to come from. On the Washington side of things, Antonio Gibson had 14 carries and two targets, 41% snaps. So J.D. McKissick was out there for 64% snaps, took four carries and six targets himself. So this is life with Antonio Gibson. He's playing through the pain. We're going to get 15 to 20 touches, more weeks than not. Unfortunately, McKissick is going to steal all the fantasy-friendly targets, and we do have potential like this game where if they get down a lot, we're just going to see simply a lot more J.D. McKissick than Gibson with this offense in hurry-up mode. Only injury to note here, Diami Brown suffered a knee injury in the first half. Probably not someone you're really rostering too heavily in season-long formats, but just keep that in mind. Curtis Samuel still not on the injured reserve list, so hey, Terry McLaurin, you know, 12 targets in this one, but if Diami Brown's going to be out too, you know, I'm sure Adam Humphreys, DeAndre Carter will mostly replace him, but the ceiling is truly the moon for McLaurin's target share here moving forward. PFF Lily stat for this matchup and for those that don't know pff lily is my lovely 29 pound wiener dog i just like to pick one stat after each game and i name it after her because it's my podcast so screw it pff lily stat aaron Rodgers since week one of last season 14 games with three plus passing touchdowns nobody else has more than 11 truly you know it's been a little bit up and down for Rodgers this year not you know wins and losses and he's being fine as he said himself last year down years for Aaron Rodgers or career years for other guys he has not been bad by any stretch of the imagination but when you go from being literally maybe I think it was the 2012 version of Rodgers where he had just bonkers numbers 2020 was if not the best version the second best version so make no mistake stick about it even with Rodgers you know regressing just a little bit from last year he is still a truly great quarterback and we are starting to see some of those big counting numbers come back to fruition in 2021 biggest shocker of the day I would say Tennessee Titans blew out the Kansas City Chiefs 27 to 3 and honestly it wasn't that close Tennessee covered easily as a four-point underdog the under cashed at 59 highest game total of the week and we got three points from Patrick Mahomes and company and it was just rough really for the whole game with them Mahomes he got it looked like he got con concussed after trying to make something happen on this like fourth and 15 uh you know late in the third quarter I believe maybe they were in the fourth quarter at that point but Andy Reid told us afterwards that he already cleared concussion protocol. The decision not to put Mahomes back in the game was a coach's decision. So good news. Mahomes should be back out there next Monday night against the Giants. They've already made that clear. The bad news was they just scored three freaking points against the Titans people. So Tyreek Hill had as many catches as you and me did at halftime. He ended up finishing with six catches for 49 yards. Also chipped in an 18-yard reverse. Travis Kelsey had 65 yards on seven catches. But yeah, people, this was a miserable game from the Chiefs off. Offense. I could have told you the three points and I think you would have been able to put that together so the only like real cool takeaway I had from the Chiefs here even in terms of just like a cool play which usually you know I could pick between 20 of these things there was a moment early in the game I think it was the second quarter they threw Kelsey this like crosser over the middle and they had it was either Daryl Williams or Jarek McKinnon one of their running backs was truly in pitch phase on the sideline so Kelsey did a mid play lateral got it to the guy and the Titans played it great I think the play only gained like eight yards but really cool evolution there to watch with the Chiefs we always see them doing this stuff I remember last year uh, in the playoffs several times they would actually put Patrick Mahomes in motion before the snap basically if they're going to roll out to the left they would have Mahomes start running snap the ball and he's already got that extra step on the defense so just cool offensive innovation I, I get it you produce three points who the hell cares about mid play laterals but hey I thought it was a cool moment. Now for the real stars of the show, Tennessee Titans, Ryan Tannehill, really, really strong performance here. 21 completions on 27 attempts, 270 yards. He threw a touchdown to our guy, A.J. Brown. Chipotle could not hold him back. Nobody can hold back A.J.B. wide receiver one season. Tannehill also chipped in a rushing touchdown on his own. Look, Darren Rodgers, State Farm belt strap is awesome. The Ryan Tannehill finger roll with the football after rushing touchdowns 
one of the more underrated uh, personal, I, I would say, NFL player celebrations. So keep an eye out for that every time you see the artist known as Tanner Throw find his way into the end zone on the ground all by himself. Um, so fun game from Tannehill. Derrick Henry. The Chiefs held Derrick Henry to 86 yards on 29 carries. He did not have a rush longer than 11 yards. Still managed to lose by 24. So Derrick Henry did get over 100 total yards thanks to having 16 receiving yards. But yeah, the one game he looked mortal. Titans still won by 24. That just goes to show you how weird of a game this truly was. Finally, age on. Oh, I, I, I'm sorry. I forgot to mention. Derrick Henry did score a touchdown. He actually threw the ball. You know, cue that scene from Friday Night Lights. Booby Miles' dad. And he can pass. Derrick Henry, five yards to Michael Pruitt on the first drive of the game. Just that cool little, you know, wasn't as much of a jump pass as it was when he got Corey Davis in the playoffs a few years ago. But yeah, you know, why don't they run that play five times a year? I thought I would be hard, hard pressed to believe linebackers are ever going to be able to comfortably, you know, sit back and guard that when you got Derrick freaking Henry coming downhill. So that was awesome. But yeah, star of the game, A.J. Brown, Arthur Juan Brown, eight catches, 133 yards and one score on just nine targets. For a second, he had it on the same drive, he scored his touchdown, which was a nice contested opportunity in the end zone. But he had a 46-yard catch down the sideline, originally ruled an incompletion, but he got two feet and a knee down, so they gave it to him. So fantastic game from A.J. Brown, the best we've seen him look all season. The guy is a fantasy football wide receiver. One people, you absolutely love to see it. Julio Jones was the odd man out here. Just four targets, caught two of them for 38 yards. Hey, until we see these targets, and maybe it is because Julio is, you know, playing through the hamstring pain a little bit more than A.J. Brown at this point. But this disparity between the guys, I think it's already been fairly wide in fantasy, but we got to continue to treat it that way. A.J. Brown's going to be a top 12, top 15 maybe top 16 receiver at worst, more weeks than not. Julio's the one that's going to be, you know, top 30, wide receiver two borderline. But hey, this was a game where the Titans only had to throw the ball 27 times, 28 if you count Derrick Henry. So we're going to need to see more volume than that for two guys to be consistent high-end performers. Just might not be a reality in this Titans offense. No real sheeshes in this one. Quickly onto the backfields. Derrick Henry, again, he's dominating 75% of the snaps. We did see Darrington Evans return. He got two carries and two targets himself. Jerry McNichols was still playing ahead of Evans. So I think if Henry did get hurt, it'd probably be Evans getting the more featured role. But I wouldn't be surprised as well if McNichols was way too involved on passing downs for our satisfaction. So probably neither guy worthy of a bench spot. In super deep leagues, though, if someone just happened to leave Evans off on the side, might not be the worst deep, deep bench stash on the Chiefs side. I think Daryl Williams, more great usage. They just were never in a position to run the ball. 65% snaps. Jarek McKinnon only had 29% snaps. Daryl had all five of the backfield's carries, three targets. Jarek McKinnon also chipped in three targets. So we didn't get the touchdowns from Daryl Williams last week. And we talked about this. Like we just don't usually see the Chiefs in enough of a position to give their running back 20 plus carries a game. The good news is Daryl continues to siphon away, you know, a handful of targets. So he only had 20 rushing yards, but he also chipped in three catches for 30 receiving yards. He'll remain a high end RB2 for however long Clyde Edwards Alaire's sideline, which will be at least another week there on the old injured reserve. Mentioned that Patrick Mahomes has cleared a concussion protocol. He is good there. And again, fully expected to suit up in week eight against the Giants. PFF Lily stat is for Derrick Henry because people, winter is coming. And that's like, I, what is he going to do when it starts snowing? Run for 400 yards a game? Because in his, in his career now, Derrick Henry career yards per carry by month. In September, he's averaged four yards per carry. In October, 4.4 yards per carry in November, 5.6. December, 5.5. January, 5.3. So I love when football stats like match up with what we would think would happen when it gets cold, when it becomes so much harder to hit someone and it hurts more and getting out of bed is harder. Derrick Henry is even harder to take down. So King Henry, King State Kings, no better example than the one in Tennessee. Falcons took down the Dolphins 30 to 28. Atlanta covered as a one and a half point dog over cashed at 45 and a half. This was the only game I've gotten pretty good at tracking five games at once. We had like an octo box in the PFF office. So five games, I can generally keep track of everything that's going on. The six is where it gets a little bit tricky. So, you know, hand up my bad. If I miss any sheeshes from this one, I'll make sure to rewatch it in the morning, but a lot of great plays here, particularly from Kyle Pitts, seven catch. 163 yards on eight targets. So I remember, I think it was like week four or week five, 
I never dropped Kyle Pitts in the ranks. I mocked the idea that like Ridley being out was even this big reason to boost up Pitts. Like, yeah, I think we all expected him to have a great game against the Jets, but we've all been expecting him to have great games all season long. And even before Ridley was sidelined for personal reasons in the London game, Pitts was still seeing excellent usage. I will say I didn't see too much from Pitts in the first four weeks that, you know, indicated that he was this truly quote unquote generational talent that many advertised him as not saying I was out on the guy. It's just a four week sample size, just a reality. Like he didn't make that many crazy athletic plays in the first four weeks of the year. Uh, yeah, we saw plenty of those out here today. One handed catch down the sideline. That was honestly, maybe the single best catch of the day was absolutely awesome. And then at the end of the game, the Dolphins ended up taking a 28, 27 lead deep in the fourth quarter. Kyle Pitts gets matched up one-on-one -on, -one on the outside against Xavier Howard, truly one of the better cornerbacks in the league, man on man coverage. Kyle Pitts beats him downfield and puts the Falcons in position to win the game. So Kyle Pitts again, 163 yards. And they were a legit, awesome, eye test friendly 163 yards. You know, he's someone that we've been ranking top five, top six in the tight end, uh, you know, just ranks week in and week out. And I think that's, he's certainly not going lower than that moving forward. But man, oh man, if he is going to start looking this good and keep the high end target, we're going to have to start looking at guys like Hawkinson, like Kittle, even, and maybe even Darren Waller if he's not healthy and start looking at, hey, maybe Kyle Pitts should actually be the tight end two behind Travis Kelsey. Um, would also mention that Matt Ryan, third straight, largely great game, 336 yards, two touchdowns, one interception, and even that play didn't even seem to be on him. From my view of it, it looked like Calvin Ridley actually got the ball ripped out by a defender, and it went into another Dolphins hand. So Matt Ryan really was looking washed in the first three weeks. He is not going down the Big Ben route. Three, I didn't see his final PFF passing grade yet for this one, but he was high 80s in his last two. Wouldn't be surprised if he's back with a more than solid grade in this one. So Matt Ryan, if anyone's out there just not really trusting the guy in the waiver, he's got his uh, healthy options back. And I do think Matt Ryan will be flirting with that QB1 borderline in a similar manner as, you know, your Matthew Stafford's Kirk Cousins of the world here in the second half of the season. Also on the Falcons, real quick, Russell Gage caught a 49-yard touchdown. That was a beautiful throw from Matt Ryan down the field. And Calvin Ridley disappointed people. 10 targets, 4 catches, 26 yards, and a score. This We don't see this from Calvin Ridley. I mean, if you listen to this podcast last year, one of my uh, kind of recurring stats I'd always bring out for Ridley was how in every single game that this dude had had at least 8 targets, like his worst game, I think, ever with 8 targets, fantasy-wise, was something like 5 catches for 50 yards and a touchdown. Like, we just had have not seen him bust really and he did still find the end zone in this one but man oh man or should I say sheesh oh sheesh he is just getting the air yards he's getting the targets and he's not quite coming through with it so I still do think Calvin Ridley is a true he can be a team's wide receiver one no problem and when you have Kyle Pitts like Ridley isn't even this true like he's not like it's not like a Devontae Adams situation where there's pretty much nobody else of the high end talent range to throw the ball to so Ridley I still do think he's a quality buy low at at this point, though, are we going to get that top five production a lot of us were hoping for? You know, with Pitts doing his thing, it could be more of a borderline wide receiver one, upside wide receiver two situation. You're still starting Ridley every single week with confidence, people. Just maybe, you know, with that total upside ceiling, might need to uh, just rein that down just a little bit. The good news was that he did get shaken up. It's not good he got shaken up in the third quarter, but he did return for the end of the game and did not seem to be any worse for the wear after taking a pretty big hit. On the Miami side of things, I know Tua was a popular streamer because of this great matchup with the Falcons. And yeah, he helped you out. 291 yards, four touchdowns, two picks. Only threw eight incompletions on the day. But yeah, the two picks were both horrendous. And this happened to him in London as well. Like he just really had one or two horrendous throws that kind of marred an otherwise okay enough performance. So Tua, hey, it's his second game back from injury. He's still only a handful of starts into his NFL career. I don't think we need to write him off as just being a crappy quarterback for his entire career. I will say though, this uh, wasn't to me the most impressive four touchdown game we've ever seen, but if you throw four touchdowns, who the hell cares how impressive it was, particularly in fantasy land. So he gave the Dolphins a chance to win at the end of the game, which is all you can ask for. So if he can just, again, limit those one to two excruciating mistakes, then we're going to be really in business with Tua, I think, as both a fantasy and real life quarterback. Also got 29 yards on the ground from Tua. So we 
we, your fantasy uh, football investors, thank you for giving us that floor as well. But really, the offense continued just to flow almost exclusively through Jalen Waddle and Mike Jasicki. Both guys had eight targets. Both guys caught seven of them. Both guys cleared 80 yards receiving. Mike Jasicki came down with one of the touchdowns. Also, Mac Hollins, Isaiah Ford, and Miles Gaskin. Now, before you think Gaskin just took over this backfield, realized Malcolm Brown left in the first half with a quad injury and did not return. So, you know. I hope you started Gaskin and you were able to get the streamer of the week. Uh, not necessarily of the week, but you were able to get the good version of him in between all these busts that we uh, kind of continue to see from the Dolphins, you know, alleged week-to-week RB1. But just realize, as long as Malcolm Brown is going to be active and healthy, it's going to be problematic to assume that this sort of usage is going to stay the same here moving forward. But with that usage, it sure looked good in this one. 63% of the Dolphins snaps, 15 carries, 4 tar- targets. Salvin Ahmed was down 30%, 7 carries, 2 targets. So again, if Brown's out of the picture, I say this all the time, we can live with two RB committees. There's only so many workhorses anymore. Once Brown comes back in the picture, that's where Gaskin is going to be back down into RB3 territory. That'll be one of the more important waiver wire, not waiver wire, injury uh, to, in, injuries to watch here moving forward because Gaskin, he catches the balls. If he can be the RB1 in an offense that at least isn't quite as bad as maybe they looked earlier in the season, 28 points. I know that's against the Falcons, but we'll take it. That's where Gaskin can get back to being that, you know, at least borderline if not upside rb2 that a lot of people were hoping he'd be when he drafted him back in august on the Falcons side of things the return of gage and ridley really didn't turn down patterson's extra receiver usage a lot which was good to see he still had five targets he only caught two of them for one yard but 73 percent snaps for cordero patterson while mike davis still had 60 percent of the offensive snaps so unfortunately i got burned a little bit on davis and dfs i know i answered a lot of start sick questions with him so my apologies I'm guessing there weren't a ton of better options out there during by again, but the thesis was, hey, Mike Davis, I know the production wasn't always there, but he is a top five running back this year in total force missed tackles, and he had at least 15 touches in every single game until this week when he only had four touches. So unfortunate, and at this point, seeing the disparity in usage between him and Patterson, yeah, Mike Davis is borderline droppable at this point. I don't think he's someone where if it's a situation where you need to cut a real proven player or like if you're looking at taking a zero in a spot because of Mike Davis, I think we're at the point where we can probably get rid of him because Cordero Patterson, 14 carries and four targets. Mike Davis, four carries and zero targets. We were seeing more of split usage between these guys in past weeks and you could argue that Patterson was so much more involved as a receiver because Gage was out and really was out for at least one game. But seeing this usage after a bye is worst case. So Wayne Gallman was only involved 5% snap only had one carry and I'm sure Davis if he keeps this role will be around that double digit carry mark more weeks than not but again just the way way production's going and the way that Patterson's role just continues to grow and grow by the week until Patterson gets hurt Davis is not going to be a recommended start here moving forward I think that's about it here. Uh, yeah, I mentioned the only sheesh was that Matt Ryan interception that was really tipped away from Ridley. So let's talk Kyle Pitts here for the PFF Lily stat because, you know, everyone's just going on and on about the rookie tight end records he's breaking. And that stuff's great, but Kyle Pitts is really much closer to the Mike Jasicki tight end than he is to an actual like NFL tight end. And this is not hate on Mike Jasicki. I'm annoyed because going into this week, Jasicki had only played 13 snaps as a true inline tight end this year. I think it was 16, actually, for those counting at home. Mike Jasicki is a great receiver. Who gives a shit what you want to call him, a tight end or wide receiver? The people that do give a shit are NFL teams and agents. That's why I think Jasicki would be better off calling himself a wide receiver because they get paid more on average than tight ends. But whatever. In fantasy land, we don't care. I would just say that like, let's not pretend like Kyle Pitts and Mike Jasicki are you know, in the same kind of stratosphere as your Rob Gronkowski, Jason Witten, the true blocker receiver tight end that we're seeing in a bunch of these record books. So let's compare him to just other rookies who cares about the position and he's still awesome. That's my point here. I'm not trying to downgrade Kyle Pitts by any stretch. Let's hype him up by not comparing him to Mike Ditka's rookie tight end records and stuff. Let's show that he is putting up huge numbers as a rookie who gives a damn about the position. And with that, I have accomplished this. So most receiving yards by a rookie 
in weeks one through seven since 2010. Jamar Chase, number one. Justin Jefferson, two. Amari Cooper, three. C.D. Lamb, four. Kelvin Benjamin, five. He had a good rookie year, okay? Chill out. I know. I know he's a borderline tight end himself, but just chill out. And at number six, Kyle Pitts with 471 receiving yards. And he already had a bye week. So Justin Jefferson had a bye week in this too. So I'm not saying Pitts is the only one that had that uh, qualification. But truly, people, Kyle Pitts, call him a tight end, call him a wide receiver. He has been a number one receiver, weapon, athlete already through seven weeks of the career. But yeah, targets this season for Kyle Pitts. He's had 22 in the slot, 13 out wide, only seven as a true in-line tight end. So I don't know. I, I just, I still don't know why Kyle Pitts didn't say he was a wide receiver coming out. I don't know how it benefited him, but whatever. He's one of fantasy's top five tight ends every single week moving forward. Patriots absolutely beat down the Jets, 54-13. New England covered as 7.5-point favorites. The overcashed at 42.5. Patriots managed to get that one all by themselves. Yeah, this was all the Patriots pretty much from the beginning. Um, first touchdown of the day, Kendrick Bourne got a swing. They, they threw him like a, he went kind of in that orbit motion, and they threw him the ball like it was going to be a swing pass, but it went backwards, so he ended up throwing a touchdown to Nelson Aguilar. Um, you know, I consider myself a fairly solid meme person here on uh, the old Twitter sphere. And I went with the one of Squidward looking out the window at Patrick and SpongeBob having fun labeled Patrick and SpongeBob, Kendrick Bourne, and Nelson Aguilar. And unfortunately our guy, Jacoby Myers was Squidward stuck looking on at the fun because once again, Jacoby Myers played a 60 minute NFL football game, did not manage to find the end zone. So Aguilar, that was one of his only two catches in this one. He's not someone that's exactly rising up the ranks. Kendrick Bourne, he threw the touchdown and he also had six 68 yards and so close to scoring another one. He caught a BEA beautiful deep ball from Mac Jones down the sideline for 46 yards was down at just short of the goal line at the one yard line. So that was a great play from Bourne. We continue to see him make a couple really great plays every single week. Unfortunately, he couldn't get that receiving touchdown for himself. And yeah, credit to Mac Jones. Again, that 46-yarder down the sideline was a beautiful ball on the game. 307 yards, two scores. Again, inches away from having three scores. Only took one sack. You know, zero interceptions, zero fumbles. The guy is just already limiting mistakes, and we're seeing growth by the week with his ability to make bigger plays down the field. So, I don't know. God forbid. I know it's not exactly in the Patriots' history of overpaying for wide receivers or even hitting on their high draft picks at receiver and I'm just kind of thinking of Nikhil Harry there uh, with that one. But hey, maybe at some point, you know, the leading target getters aren't Brandon Bolden, Kendrick Bourne, Nelson Aguilar, and Jacoby Myers. Not that there's anything wrong with those guys, but would it kill you, New England, to give your rookie QB a true alpha receiver? Hopefully we see that here in the upcoming years. Um, and yeah, on the uh, other side of the ball, New York Jets. We only got to see Zach Wilson out there for 10 passes. He ended up suffering a knee injury. PCL wasn't able to return. He actually picked up a pretty deep uh, defensive pass interference. The Keelan Cole got the Jets in position to score one of their two touchdowns. Uh, just wasn't able to return to the game. Some of the post-game quotes about him still saying his knee feels loose. Not sounding too good. It does look like Mike White could be under center more weeks than not here, at least in the near future. And credit to Mike White for not completely shitting the bed here. I mean, two 202 yards, one touchdown, two pretty bad picks. But we did see him at least have a couple nice throws to Corey Davis, you know, in the intermediate areas of the field. And the touchdown he threw was on the goal line. Great catch by Davis in the back of the end zone. We're looking at like a Houston Texans situation here. We can trust Corey Davis to an extent as a boomer bust kind of wide receiver three, similar to what Brandon Cooks is basically turning into at this point. And that's it. I mean, credit to, uh, you know, Jamison Crowder a couple of these weeks. And we've seen uh, Elijah Moore flash. He actually had a 19 yard touchdown on a reverse in this one. But when we have an offense that is just rotating all these receivers and we're going to see them with game implied point totals of like 15 or fewer more weeks than not, it's just going to be tough to get behind any of these players in the New York Jets passing game. The run game, though, we might just just have one guy, and we told you about it in last week's waiver wire episode to get behind, and that is Michael Carter. 72% snaps, people, 11 carries, and a fantasy friendly eight targets, of which he caught all eight for 67 scoreless yards. Look, we also had Ty Johnson coming in, getting seven targets himself. He caught six of those for 65 yards. This is not an offense like Detroit that I think really plans to evolve the passing game through the running backs. A lot of that was just, I think, uh, 
reality of losing by 41 points. You're getting a lot of open dump downs, but that's 77%, 72%, excuse me, snap usage for Carter. Easily a season high, and that's the sort of post buy bump that we were hoping for out of Michael Carter. So with that usage, people, Michael Carter is going to be on that RB2 borderline here moving forward. Again, we can live with two RB backfields, and Tevin Coleman wasn't involved at all here. So it's Michael Johnson, and to a lesser extent, Ty Johnson, and because of that, Michael Carter season. So I know I messed up the name there. I probably will mess up a few more. Kind of hard doing a 90-minute pod all solo. But hey, we will watch the film and get better. As always, my apologies. Only thing with Ty Johnson, he did briefly leave the game in the third quarter, being evaluated for a concussion. But he did return. And he also actually had a goal line touchdown that was nullified on a false start. I know the play shouldn't have happened to begin with. But like they let it go. This wasn't like a false start in the middle of the play. Everyone stopped. It was a one afterwards where everyone thought it was going to be like a hold. I said, oh, actually, it was a false start. Shouldn't have been the play. So Ty Johnson could have been a little bit bigger day. We're not going to touch him in fantasy people. Just Michael Carter, just Corey Davis. That's all you need to know about the Jets offense these days. With the Patriots, Damian Harris, awesome game. 14 carries, 106 yards, got a pair of touchdowns. We also saw him chip in two receptions for seven yards. It's just like, man, the Patriots win 54-13, and we only had 14 carries for Damian Harris. He looked so good out there early, and you could have gotten a guess he was going to go for 200-plus seemingly the way things were rolling. But they got J.J. Taylor involved with nine carries, and Brandon Bolden, seven targets, six catches in the passing game. Credit to him for converting those into 79 yards and a score. So really, two fantasy relevant Patriots backs are emerging and we'll see if uh, JJ Taylor who scored a pair of touchdowns himself on the ground has more of a consistent role in neutral game scripts I really wouldn't bet on it too much but overall it was Damon Harris 46% snaps Brandon Bolden and JJ Taylor each at 27% Damon Harris we know he's one of the most game script dependent backs in fantasy that's why we told you to play him this week in a game that pitted the Patriots as touchdown home favorites I think that's about it on this one. On to our PFF. Okay, one last thing. John U. Smith left in the second quarter with a shorter injury. They were actually really going out of their way to get John U. more involved. He had a carry, and he had uh, five targets early on. I mean, again, this dude only had 12 routes like a week ago or so. I think it was 18 routes total over the past two weeks. It was like six routes in a game. Even worse than I remember for John U. Smith. They clearly wanted to get him more involved early, but again, left with that shoulder injury. And that's problematic. Well, I'm not a doctor. Well, find out what the actual diagnosis is but shoulder and rib injuries you know for a quarterback if it's not the throwing arm I kind of think and maybe even a wide receiver I think okay not going to be pretty when they take those few hits but it's also not something that necessarily will limit their snap by snap participation because they're not getting hit the same way that tight ends and running backs and offensive linemen are every single play so Jonu wasn't someone we were trusting to begin with in fantasy land going into this week and while the uses look good before he got hurt I think there's enough concern right now about him potentially you know regressing the other way where he's now just playing on like a snap limit because of the injury where yeah still nothing to do with Jonu Smith Finally, our PFF Lily matchup stat here is the Mac Jones deep ball. Weeks one through five, Mac Jones completed just four of 19 passes, thrown 20 yards downfield for 97 yards, zero touchdowns, two picks. He was PFF's 33rd highest graded quarterback on passes, thrown 20 yards downfield. Over the last two weeks, five for nine, 190 yards, two touchdowns, zero picks. PFF's fifth highest graded quarterback thrown at least 20 yards downfield. So, I get it. Mac Jones, he's not going to completely blow you away with all these, you know, tight window rocket launcher throws. But, you know, you also don't go broke taking a profit. The better Mac Jones can just, I think, handle that, you know, grasp that line between being too conservative and also making the defenses respect him downfield, which, again, he is getting better and better at by the week, the better he will be a professional and fantasy quarterback. Giants took down the Panthers 25 to 3. Giants covered as three point dogs. The under cashed at 43. Yeah, people, we saw, uh, you know, the real Sam Darnold finally decided to uh, stand up in this one. And it was a concern that we had made very public all offseason here on the PFF Fantasy Football Podcast. And credit to Sam, really had a great first three games of the year, even first four or five games. If you just want to look at it from a fantasy perspective, it would just be first four games. Yeah, this was not Sam Darnold's best hour. Just 111 passing yards and 25 pass attempts, one pick, three sacks, 
didn't give us any rushing floor. And he also had an intentional grounding from his own end zone, which is why we had the quirky 25-point total there on the Giants. So got a safety for that one. And yeah, guys, this was just a brutal performance from Sam, Don from Sam Darnold. So bad that P.J. Walker came in in relief. Now, P.J. Walker... Houston Roughnecks XFL superstar has looked good in the past. He came in last year and actually had a spot start, got the Panthers a win. He's got the sort of dual threat ability. You know, he used to play with Temple under Matt Rule to feasibly be a fantasy friendly quarterback. Just three of 14 passing, though, for 33 yards, chipped in 13 yards on the ground. But look, Matt Rule has already said post game that Sam Darnold is still the starter. He better be. He's guaranteed $18.9 million in 2022. But yeah, at this point, Darnold, and particularly P.J. Walker, I mean, we don't have to worry about Walker truly in fantasy, but Darnold is a more risky streamer than ever. And really looking forward, the schedule remains not too brutal, but guys, we're not going back to that week's one through three goodness. We get the Falcons next week, so maybe we can get behind that. But after that, we got the Patriots in Arizona, then against Washington, Miami, and Falcons again. So at least for, you know, it is crazy. Once I say that out loud, I realize Darnold really just has a great schedule all year round. But the fact that he now has the potential to get benched during the game, seemingly each and every week, if this is going to continue to go south, it's going to make him a far more risky fantasy streamer than in the past. So against the Falcons, I still think he'll probably be in the upside QB2 territory. But hey, those pipe dreams that we were seeing, you know, in the first three, four weeks of maybe Darnold being this legit top 12 QB for the season, I think they were uh, nothing except a pipe dream, likely not coming to fruition with the Giants Daniel Jones only 203 yards and a touchdown took two sacks but did chip in 28 yards on the ground look Kadarius Tony, Kenny Galladay and Sterling Shepard were all out I don't want to be too tough on Danny Dimes here because when you don't have your top three receivers yeah I wouldn't expect you to have all that much success throwing the ball so credit to him for at least limiting the mistakes zero interceptions and you know a rarity for Daniel Jones didn't even fumble the ball once so he actually made probably the single best player from this game real nice 16 yard catch from Dante Pettis one-handed and he took a freaking hit like Pettis threw Daniel Jones a hospital ball and he took the lick still held on to it so Daniel Jones continuing to show people just how athletic he is at things that don't even involve passing a couple sheeshes in this one Daniel Jones touchdown to Kyle Rudolph would end up being ruled just short you know he was just short of the goal line nothing wrong there after that though they had three more chances to try to score from inside the one yard line Devontae Booker got stuffed twice and we had another Jones incompletion so could have easily been a score total ending or beginning with a three for the Giants wasn't meant to be um, on the running back side of things Devontae Booker 14 carries and happened to soak up 82% of the Giants snaps and had three targets so I was almost surprised we didn't see these carries in the 20s, uh, you know, given the game script of this one. They did find a way to get Elijah Penny, nine carries for 24 yards. But hey, if Saquon Barkley is going to be out again, people, I know it's not pretty for Booker. He is not, he will not be confused with Saquon Barkley ever with anything other than his workload, which continues to put him squarely in the RB2 side of things. So answered almost every start sick question I got this morning about Devontae Booker with him, because again, it's just so hard to fade these running backs that are looking at a 15 touch floor regardless of how bad their offense might be on the Panthers side of things a little bit of a step back here for Chuba Hubbard 55% snaps where Royce Freeman was in there for 44% so Chuba still had 12 carries and five targets but Royce was soaking up I'm guessing a lot of those just kind of pass blocking pass down snaps because that's really what they were in for the majority of this game so that'll be a good one to check out Dwayne's utilization report we'll find out how much of that was mop up time but even then like looking at the touch distribution which is what matters I don't think too many of us are in point per snap leagues I I mean, seeing Chuba still manage to get 17 of the backfield's 21 combined carries and targets, that's still a pretty elite disparity there. So Chuba, he's not Christian McCaffrey, but his role is like 90% of Christian McCaffrey. And because of that, we can continue to squeeze him in the top 24 fantasy running backs on a weekly basis for as long as McCaffrey is going to be sidelined. 
any other notes from this one? Just this, you know, I when Sam Darnold gets benched and when PJ Walker goes three for 14, I'm sure you all can put together that DJ Moore and Robbie Anderson are going to struggle as well. UC has continued to be fantastic. DJ Moore had 10 targets. He caught six for 73. Robbie Anderson had nine targets, caught just three of them for 14. So, you know, DJ is someone that, yeah, you, you continue to fire up, even if we have to drop him a little bit more around the wide receiver one borderline. The usage and the talent still check all the boxes of a top 12 fantasy receiver Robbie someone that you know we've had low I was talking him up this week more for from DFS perspective because over the past three weeks he was tied for eighth in targets so you know as Dwayne and I like to say we can't predict the future but we we can't read the future we can read the data so that's all we're trying to do with Robbie and he is proven to be an exception and I've tried to look at things deeper than just pure targets again the stat I mentioned throughout this week was Air yards that are basically prayer yards. I tracked all the incompletions quarterbacks have been thrown to wide receivers that were deemed to be the quarterback's fault. Both DJ Moore and Robbie Anderson were top five receivers in total air yards that should basically be called prayer yards because they didn't have a chance in hell of actually catching it. So Moore with a legit quarterback under center would be a top five weekly receiver. He doesn't have a legit quarterback under center, so we need to adjust accordingly. With the Giants, yeah, Dante Pettis caught a touchdown, uh, five catches for 39 yards. Darius Slayton, five catches, 63 yards. Evan Ingram, six catches, 44 yards. These guys are all fine, you know, in the spot starts. But, hey, Sterling Shepard was a game-time decision with the hamstring. Kenny Galladay, I believe he's not an injured reserve. Um, and Kadarius Tony, I believe, also is not on injured reserve with the ankle. So whenever any of these guys come back, that's going to reduce Pettis and, to a lesser extent, Slayton as non-viable fantasy assets. Evan Ingram. Hey, you know, he's getting the eight targets, but again, he's getting eight targets in a game where Danny Dimes didn't have his top three receivers. So Ingram's still going to be someone I'm going to be pushing down outside my top 12 weekly tight ends more weeks than not. PFF Lily matchup stat. It's a Sam Darnold passing grade by week, people. Because, man, week one, 79.5. That was the 10th highest mark in the week. Week two, 71.1. 16th. That's fine. Hey, how many times do we see Sam Darnold even be average in New York? We'll take an average game. Week three, 76.3 against the Texans. 13th highest grade of the week. Let's go. Everyone's back in on Sam Darnold since then. 54.7, 44.8, 56.2, and today 56.4. Good for rankings of 27th, 33rd, 24th. And as of today at 6 p.m., again, with all these buys, Sam Darnold just had the 20th highest passing grade of the week. So he has certainly entered a situation where I think the clock has struck midnight on Darnold's fairy tale story. Bengals. Our Cincinnati Bengals, PFF offices are in Cincinnati. Only reason why I say that, our Cincinnati Bengals defeated the Ravens 41-17. to Since he covers as six and a half point dogs, the over cashes at 46 points. Bravo, Joe Burrow. You know, one of the big stats we went into this week with was how Burrow had been other than Kyler Murray. And even if you just wanted to uh, look at more stats than just PFF grades, arguably better than Kyler Murray at facing the blitz. Ravens have been entering this week the league's third most blitz heavy defense um, out of just the entire league so Burrow on this one 416 yards three touchdowns one pick that was a bad throw but when you're feeling yourself like this like yeah okay he threw one in the double coverage to Jamar Chase he shouldn't have in the end zone basically just like a heat check that went south for him so I'm not even going to put too much blame on Joe Burrow but look as great as Joe Burrow was Jamar Chase was the true star of the show only 10 targets caught eight of them for 201 yards and a score that went 82 yards to the house. Basically, everything came against Marlon Humphrey. I mean, cool stat from PFF's own Mike Renner. Humphrey had never given up more than 146 receiving yards in a game. And again, Jamar Chase just went for 201. And the fact that he didn't do this the way he had been, because Chase, look, he hadn't been disappointing in anywhere on the field, but you, you guys see his highlights. Like how many times was he just going down the sideline, vertical, Burrow put the ball where it needed to be? That seemed to be the majority of his big plays. He had the long, deep cross against the Packers. He was making some other things happen, but generally he was winning on deep, vertical passes. That wasn't the case in this one. He hit some great back shoulders because the guy's got fantastic ball skills, but it was the yak and the slants and the crossers that we really just hadn't seen from Chase yet. I mean, I remember before... 
before he even had the 82-yard catch-and-run touchdown, which, again, was just spectacular. Broke multiple tackles on the play. Before he had that, he had back-to-back -back catches right in Humphrey's grill. One a contested catch down the sideline and another on a slant where he just ran away from Humphrey and picked up like 26 yards. So for me and these receivers, like it's kind of the same thing I was talking about with Terry McLaurin earlier. Like when you watch these games, you notice some guys, hey, this guy's more of a field-stretching threat. This guy's more of a red zone um, guy. And maybe this one's more of a possession. Uh, we're not going to expect him to have that many big plays type of receiver. The true alphas, the true elite of the elite can do everything. And my goodness, can Jamar Chase do everything out there. So, yeah, he's blowing all these rookie stats out of the water by, uh, what you know, before the 4 o'clock games, and I think maybe even through, I'm trying to think, which rookie scored in those games. But Jamar Chase, seven receiving touchdowns. Every other rookie wide receiver combined had seven. So the days of just comparing Jamar Chase against rookie wide receivers need to be over. People, he already belongs in the top 10 NFL wide receiver discussion. I don't care how many years you guys have been playing. That's how good Jamar Chase has been this year. And he's just a joy to watch football each and every week at this point. Also had uh, C.J. Uzoma popping off for 91 yards and a pair of scores on just three targets. The 55-yard touchdown was a great throw by Burrow. Great job by Uzoma getting open deep. His second touchdown, a little bit more fluky. They ran one of those kind of bubble screen actions. Everyone bit on it, and Uzoma was free to go up the seam. Made, you know, a safety miss on a bad angle, and that was that. T. Higgins, 15 targets, which is great to see. Again, Chase only had 10. Boyd only had 7, so clearly they wanted to get Higgins more involved this week. Only caught 7 of them for 62 yards. But, hey, people, 41-17 win for the Bengals, and Joe Burrow threw the ball 38 times. So I know Chase is the one that popped off here, but this usage for both Higgins and Boyd is fantastic. So I think finally... Zach Taylor, maybe it was just because they were playing the Ravens, but I think they realized letting Joey Burrow dice up every single defense they face is their best chance of putting up points. Not so much running Mixon and Piran between the tackles. So more and more moving forward, people, I wouldn't be surprised if Higgins and Boyd can start to creep into that wide receiver two borderline themselves. Chase is a top 10 fantasy receiver regardless of the matchup moving forward. But again, if we can get that additional pass game volume that's largely been lacking from this offense, and that will be what enables Higgins and Boyd to meet their rather gaudy preseason expectations as well. Uh, Joe Mixon, 59 yards and a score on a nice little run there at the end of the game. Samaj P. Ryan at 52 yards and a score, 46-yard touchdown at the end where it seemed like the Ravens' defense was pretty much just done trying to make much happen. On the Ravens' uh, offense, Lamar Jackson, he had like three throws in this one that were just truly incredible. He had a seam uh, down the middle to Mark Andrews that was just perfectly thrown. Rashad Bateman had a deep catch down the sideline where Lamar put it where only he could get it. And a bomb touchdown, 39 yards to Marquise Hollywood Brown, where Brown didn't get two feet down, but he got the knee down and thus was rewarded the touchdown. So Lamar completed fewer than 50% of his passes. It wasn't his, his best game by any stretch. He was sacked five times, but just realized we still saw those just high-level flashes as a passer that have been more apparent than in the 2021 than they really have been for the rest of his career. Also chipped in 88 yards on the ground. Should have had, maybe not shouldn't should have had, but he had like a 40-yard monster run that would have put him well over 100 yards nullified on a hold. So would it have happened without the hold? Maybe not. It doesn't make it any less tilting for us fantasy footballers out there. And there was also a 40-yard catch to Hollywood Brown that maybe could have put Lamar over the 300-yard mark, but Lamar let him just a bit out of bounds so Hollywood could couldn't stay in. Truly hit the guy in stride down the sideline. Unfortunately, just drifted a little bit out of bounds. So the backfield, you know, the answer, who is it? Devontae Freeman, Tyson Williams, Le'Veon Bell. Answer was pretty much no in this one. And again, game script played a heavy role, but Freeman only had four carries. Bell only had five, and Tyson Williams only had two. So we continue to see minimal pass game involvement from these guys. You know, Freeman caught three passes, Tyson caught two, Le'Veon caught one. But again, people, if it's going to be this split up, and my goodness, was it, uh, this is going to be a hard group to get behind each and every week. So continuing to split things up with the Ravens while the Bengals are really more than anyone um, just looking great. I mean, at this point, the Bengals really are true contenders in the AFC and you got to give them credit for that. 
with this blowout game script. Again, Tyler Huntley was in there for Lamar Jackson for the majority of the fourth quarter. I wouldn't pay a ton of attention to the specific splits. We saw Mixon only at 54% snaps, Samaje Piran at 48%. But again, just realize a lot of this was just Piran coming in at the end in a game that had already been decided. Devontae Freeman was seemingly going to be the feature guy for Baltimore, only 39% snaps. So going into next week, if Latavius Murray is still out, I would guess Devontae Freeman would be the top guy, the one you want to start. But I don't even know if you want to start any of these guys at this point. Devontae Freeman without Murray in the lineup, still not more than a touchdown dependent RB3. PFF Lily uh, matchup note from this one per ESPN's Field Yates, friend of the PFF Fantasy Football Podcast. Jamar Chase has the most receiving yards through his first seven games in NFL history at 754. Again, people, he has not just been great for a rookie. He has been amazing as an NFL receiver, regardless of their experience. Raiders took down the Eagles. 33 to 22, covering as a one point dog. The over cashed at 48 and a half. Take a bow, Derek Carr. This has always been a Derek Carr friendly podcast. We've only existed for two years, but hey, doesn't change the fact. Uh, 31 of 34, 323 yards, two touchdowns, one interception. Kind of his fault, threw it behind Jalen Richard. But you know what? Why is Jalen Richard on the field in the first place? I'm going to blame that one on the Raiders coaching staff. I'm, you know, Half kidding here. A little tongue-in-cheek for you out there. But either way, fantastic performance from Derek Carr. And he has continued to spread around. He didn't have Darren Waller, his usual alpha target hog. He was a late, you know, we saw him. We found out Sunday morning that the ankle injury was more serious than thought. He was going to try to give it a go before game time. They decided, I think, rightfully with them having a bye in week eight. Let's let Waller get back to full health afterwards. So Waller is not out there. Foster the people Moreau, six catches, 60 yards, and a touchdown on six targets. So we really saw Moreau as a rookie make a lot of good things happen. And a lot of people were thinking maybe he could have this not huge upside, but how many offenses have two great fantasy tight ends? Pretty much none. But going into last year, some were thinking after his great rookie year that he could make something happen. But when you have Jason Witten in there, for whatever reason, uh, kind of a progress stopper, uh, if you know what I mean. So it's good to see Foster come out. And if Waller is going to miss additional time after the bye, which seems unlikely, but if he does, Foster you know, wouldn't replace Waller as fantasy's number two tight end, but he would certainly be in that top 12 conversation on a weekly basis. So great game from Moreau. Brian Ebers had a short touch down 43 yards on four targets Henry Ruggs was just kind of the odd man out here only four catches on four targets for 24 yards they managed to um, get him a carry as well for seven yards but yeah Eagles came into this one really playing great all year at limiting big plays and they were one of the best defenses in the league and just explosive pass play rate allowed in large part because of all the zone they run. They just keep everyone in front of them. Derek Carr was happy to just dink and dunk his way down the field, effectively to 33 points in a win. So great job from this passing game. But yeah, that's why you didn't see just huge gaudy numbers from uh, the usual suspects in Las Vegas. Let's see some cool plays on the other side of the ball. Shout out to Devontae Smith. Not a huge game. Five catches, 61 yards on nine targets. But he's wearing these cool-ass baggy sleeves now in the Keenan Allen mold of things. Love seeing first-year players with that sort of swag. All jokes aside, he still did have nine targets. Only Kenny Gainwell was even close to that uh, with eight. Nobody else had over five. I know it hasn't you know, been the big breakout we've been hoping for with Devontae Smith. He does remain the, the clear-cut number one option in a passing game that, yeah, is hit or miss sometimes, but at the end of the day, Jalen Hurts has gone over 300 yards in four of his 11 career starts. Style points don't matter in fantasy football. Continue to treat Devontae Smith as an upside wide receiver. Three at worst. Unfortunately, we did have some injuries here. Miles Sanders uh, was carted off with an ankle injury and did not return. Um, Dr. Evan Porras over at Fantasy Points was saying that he thought it looked a little bit like the Saquon injury, in which case we wouldn't necessarily expect an IR trip, but it's still something we'll need to monitor here moving forward. And yeah, so that basically kind of screwed up the Eagles snap counts. We saw Boston Scott and Kenneth Gamewell actually come in there at the end and split things maybe a little bit more evenly than folks were anticipating. We saw Gamewell get all the targets. Scott wasn't involved in the pass game, but Scott is capable in the pass game. So the fact that Gamewell finished with 43% snaps, Boston Scott at 35%, you know, I was maybe anticipating Gamewell taking that 70-30 leap over Scott in the event Sanders would miss time, more or less just replace what Sanders has been bringing to the table. 
table looks like it might be a bit more of a 50 50 situation so not the worst thing but again when we're already starved for touches and targets in this backfield as it is uh, it's going to be tough to treat either Gamewell or Scott as a top 24 option if Sanders winds up missing time Jalen Hurts ended up being, again, the only true usable fantasy asset in Philly that you could feel great about. 236 yards and two touchdowns through the air, also chipped in 61 yards on the ground. Lots of fumble along the way, and yes, so much of this came in the fourth quarter. I think the graphic they showed during the game was that the Eagles are the fourth highest scoring fourth quarter team in the NFL this season, but guess what? Fancy points in the fourth quarter count the same in the first quarter. So if you want to sound smart in football conversations, you can bring up how Jalen Hurts is the epitome of a great fantasy quarterback and a not-so-great real-life quarterback. But hey, that's who he is. And because of that, keep firing him up as a high-end fantasy QB1 as long as the Eagles continue to decide to make him their starting quarterback. So I don't want to say good stuff from Hurts, but he got the fantasy points, so good stuff from Hertz. Um, on the Raiders side of things, they also suffered a running back injury. Josh Jacobs was ruled out with a chest injury. Peyton Barber was not active, so because of that, we saw Kenyon Drake, uh, you know, soup up all the early down work, getting 14 carries in this one. But again, and this is why like, you don't need to even have Drake on your squad necessarily, regardless of Jacobs' status, because Jalen Richard was out there for 23% snaps, and Kenyon Drake was 39%. And then again, Richard had four targets, Drake had three, and that was with Peyton Barber out of the picture. So if we're going to bring Peyton Barber back in, it's not a guarantee he'll be as involved as he was with John Gruden. But so far, we really haven't seen this offense look all that different in the post-Gruden era. Obviously a small sample, but Drake just doesn't give you much best uh case scenario upside here in Las Vegas. So yeah, he managed to score a rushing touchdown here. He has, I think, looked better for, you know, passing the eye test over the past few weeks, but we want a number two running back because of the upside they could have if the starter goes down. Peyton Barber is the one with the massive upside, seemingly, uh, if Jacobs is going to miss time with his chest injury. So monitor Jacobs, but yeah, I think Barber would actually be the preferred waiver wire ad. I wouldn't go crazy on it. Uh, either way, he is someone that we, as we know is limited in the passing game, but yeah, yeah, don't uh, you know really buy into what Kenyon Drake seems to be selling on the box score because again I think it's more fluky and largely based on Peyton Barber not being active in this one. PFF Lily, or just one quick sheesh here. Uh, Jalen Hurts actually could have had an even bigger game. It looked like they were about to do a design run. He got stuffed on a QB sneak from the goal line. Then they went back to do a shotgun snap and he fumbled it. Um, and they basically weren't able to get back on the goal line after that. So disappointing how the way that possession ended. And also, Quez Watkins should have had a good 40 50 yarder. Jalen Hurts took a hit as he threw, wasn't able to give Quez a chance to catch the ball. So just a couple unfortunate plays there that could have made Hurts' performance bigger on the stat sheet, but our PFF Lily stat is for Mr. Derek Carr, who is the only quarterback with five games with 300 plus passing yards this year and remains PFF's number one quarterback in big time throws. I thought his best throw of the day, it was early, you know, and we've seen some Raiders games spiral out of control over the past few years. Uh, very minimal, but you know, the Falcons game last year with Carr and hey, he, he played great in the first three games of the year, as we know, or excuse me, first four games, I think. First three games, then he had two bad games, and then he's had two good games again during those bad games. You know, he has a couple bad games a year. I'm not hating on Derek Carr, but again, it looked like one of those situations where, oh man, they got to punt the ball here. What kind of car are we going to get? And he just threw a beautiful ball down the sideline to Zay Jones for 43 yards. So again, you go 31 for 34, you're going to see a lot of great throws there. And it can't, can't be all check downs, can't be all easiness there. And once again, it was not from Derek Carr. So great stuff from Carr and just on the Jalen Hurts thing, people. Looking at his stats right now, I believe he finished with 23 fantasy points. He finished with more fantasy points than Derek Carr. That's going to make him a top 12 fantasy quarterback in 10 of his 11 starts. Absolute madness. And just goes to show you, as much as we love fantasy football, doesn't always reflect real life as much as we might want it to. Rams took down the Lions 28 to 19. Revenge game success for Matthew Stafford. Not so much for Jared Goff, but Goff did cover as a 17 point dog. So kudos to him. Undercashed at 51 points. 
points. So DeAndre Swift took the freaking first possession of the game to the end zone, 63 yards on a screen pass, ended up catching eight balls for 96 yards and a score. He did let a ball bounce off his hands late in the game and it was picked off. Pretty high throw though. I am perfectly content blaming it on Jared Goff if you guys are. But really credit to Dan Campbell and the Lions. I mean, 0-17, but you continue to see them fight, fight, fight each and every week. And in this one, they had two successful fake punts and they also did a surprise onside kick, uh, which they managed to get back early in the game so they're out there trying they're just not a very good team and that is why they're 0 7 at this point so again awesome game from swift he also chipped in 48 yards on the ground and we even saw khalif raymond pop off a little bit six catches 115 yards but yeah look in this detroit offense we got Swift, we got Hawkinson, who caught six of his nine targets for 48 yards. That's going to be pretty much it on a weekly basis. Khalif popped off this week, and if you're, if you're desperate in a deep league, yeah, he's fine to throw in there as a flex or as a deep bench guy. But we also have someone like Amon Ross St. Brown, who had five-plus catches in three straight weeks, didn't get a single target in this one. And it was also a Monroe St. Brown's birthday and freaking golf couldn't throw him the ball one time. It was also Jalen Ramsey's birthday and golf threw him the ball once. So not cool, Jared. Um, would have been nice to get a Monroe St. Brown. A couple of my uh, DraftKings tournament lineups are not very happy with you. But, oh, well. Um, only other note I had here with Detroit was that Swift's day actually could have been bigger as a receiver. Could have had a 15-yard walk-in touchdown, but there was some miscommunication between him and Goff. Originally, like when I was watching it with uh, some of the PFF guys, we were all like, my goodness, Jared, like what a brutal throw. We saw the replay, and it seemed like Goff maybe thought Swift was going to sit. Swift started going out into the flat a little bit more. Either way, whoever's fault it was, Goff and Swift mixed, missed out on what could have been another uh, receiving score between the two. On the Rams side of things, look, Matthew Stafford, it's hard to complain too much. 334 yards and three touchdowns. Similar to Tua, though, like where I said it was a bad four-touchdown game. Like, relative to what we would expect from 300-plus yards and three touchdowns, wasn't the best performance from Matthew Stafford, I thought. It's just so easy. So it's so easy for this Rams offense all the time. And I think that's why Jared Goff was so successful for so many years. Like, you don't see Stafford have to use that howitzer for a right arm all that often. You don't need to see him make all these tight window throws because he doesn't even have to. Sean McVay just schemes up a one wide open play after another for everyone's favorite fantasy wide receiver, if he's on your team, Cooper Cup, who had 10 catches for 156 yards and two touchdowns. Touchdowns. His two touchdowns were as easy as hell. He had the one uh, play that I think Michael Thomas kind of made famous with the Saints, that quick wide receiver uh, screen hitter where they just skirt in, no problem. And then he had another easy one in the flat where he had no defenders and a few yards. Like, look, Cooper Cup is awesome. He is so skilled and talented. Like, if you want to call him before this year one of the top 15 most talented receivers in the league, I think you'd have a case to be made. Like, you guys remember that crazy long yak touchdown he had against the Saints a few years ago where he broke, like, five tackles? He has never been a product of the system. I think he'd be fantastic on all 32 teams. But it's like, this season, he has nine touchdowns, and I swear, like, eight of them, I'm going to go back tomorrow. One of the things I wrote down as I was watching this was go back and watch all all of Cup's touchdowns. How many of these are just walk-ins? Like, no one around the guy. At some point, I understand Sean McVay's a smart guy, but can't a defense just look at Cooper Cup and say, we're not going to let this guy score? I don't know. Doesn't seem to be happening yet. We'll see if it happens later. But in the meantime, Cooper Cup is making as good an argument as anyone to be fantasy's overall wide receiver one. He is in the stat sheet. It's just a situation like, do we really want to rank him ahead of Devontae Adams and Tyree Kill? Maybe, because all he does is keep scoring touchdowns. So Robert Woods also six, six catches, 70 yards. He scored a two-point conversion. Tyler Higby, five catches, 46 yards. Van Jefferson, 443, and he did score a touchdown. Um, Stafford, I would say that was maybe his best throw of the day was that touchdown to Van Jefferson. Um, yeah, put it right where it needed to be and gave him several other chances downfield before uh, that the second-year receiver just wasn't quite able to come up with. So, hey, Goff. Rams, they're six and one. I'm just saying, like, this just to me was not one of the most dominant games we have seen from Stafford, despite what the box score suggests. Quickly in the running back rooms, yeah, Daryl Henderson. I know you guys probably didn't love the fantasy points, but the usage remained truly elite. 89% snaps, 15 carries, six targets. Sony Michelle, just 11% snaps, two carries, and zero targets. So, yeah, Henderson, 45 scoreless rushing yards, 19 scoreless receiving yards. We can live 
with that when it's someone getting 20 touches and hey people it'll it'll be better and excuse me it was 21 combined carries and targets so it sucks that he bummed out this week but believe me there is no reason unless Henderson gets hurt that he is leaving your starting fantasy lineup here in the year 2021 and the line side of things this is it's basically what happened last week like DeAndre Swift in games that they're going to be trailing towards the end we're going to see him take a nice little lead and snaps Jamal Williams will make things a little bit closer on the ground though so overall DeAndre Swift, 73% snaps. Jamal Williams, 32%. But Swift held a narrow carry lead, 13-12. to 12. Swift got all nine of the backfield targets, though, which is great to see. So Williams continued to make the most out of his carries. Like, I don't view this as an Aaron Jones, Jamal Williams, free Aaron situation where we just wanted Jones, who was the superior player in rushing, receiving, any metric you wanted to look at. I don't view this like that because Williams has been better than Swift as a rusher just about any way you want to look at. So, no, I... I do think this offense is better off, you know, feeding Jamal Williams some carries as well. It just doesn't matter for DeAndre Swift, people. Again, going into this week, only Najee Harris and Derrick Henry had more expected fantasy points because he is a cheat code as a receiver. At this point, with Najee and the Steelers on a bye, Swift is actually going to be the number one running back in overall targets at this point. So again, historically, targets, you need about 2.7 carries to equal the expected fantasy value you get from only one target. That's why Swift is able to just be a true diamond in an otherwise pretty rough Lions offense. PFF Lily stat is for Cooper Cup. 17 game pace, people. 136 catches, 1,965 yards, and 22 scores. Absolute madness. He has done this on target total since week one. 10, 11, 12, 13, 10, 12, and most recently 13 again. So Cooper, you know, death taxes, Cooper Cup getting double-digit targets, continue to fire him up as a top three, if not the top one receiver in all of fantasy football. Two more games to get through. Thank you, as always, for tuning in to the PFF Fantasy Football Podcast. How the Cardinals take down the Texans 31-5. to We had two funky safeties in this one giving us, or just two safeties on the slate as a whole, giving us some of these weird scores. Uh, shout out Giants over the Panthers 25-3 to as well. But yeah, Cardinals covered as a 20-and-a-half point favorite. The under cash at 47-and-a-half. Brief, scary moment for Kyler Murray. He got banged up in his end zone, taking the safety uh, to begin with on a read option play kind of got his neck twisted in a weird way he came back out and was good to go so kyler came back in 261 yards three touchdowns one overthrow on a pick but man oh man guys just continuing to strengthen that mvp case if tom brady's gonna keep doing what he's doing he might just you know be able to take down that award once again but in terms of just what quarterback from week one to week seven has most consistently i think stole the show from an eye test perspective it has been kyler murray and he made Again, he's made so many good throws all year. 70% catchable deep ball rate entering this game. No other team was over 61%. And he might have thrown his single best deep ball of the year to A.J. Green down the sideline. Any of you phone grinders that listen to this will know better than me, but I believe we call that a honey hole shot when you got the cover two safety deep and you got the cornerback trailing trying to make things tough. The best quarterbacks will still find a way to fit that down the sideline into that honey hole. Kyler did that for 41 yards and A.J. Green later for another uh, beautiful throw and catch. So Green caught all three of his passes, 66 yards. I do think a lot more that has to do with Kyler than necessarily a rebirth from A.J. Green. But hey, he's catching the passes thrown his way. Kudos to you, A.J. Also had another old man balling out in this one. Zach Ertz caught three of five targets for 66 yards and a 47-yard touchdown. Zach Ertz, if you guys don't follow the Zach Ertz uh, Yak account on Twitter, you're missing out. Some uh, just lovely individual basically responds, no, did Zach Ertz break a tackle every time he uh, has a play? And he did not break a tackle on his 47-yard touchdown, but he did legitimately look fast out there, and he at least made a uh, safety take a bad angle. So good stuff from Ertz, and that is actually... Let's see. He had a 53-yard catch in 2017, a 60-yard catch in 2015. At a minimum, that is Ertz's longest catch over the past four seasons. So good stuff from him. He's not washed. Look, I don't think that Ertz, though, is necessarily going to be this offense's number two receiver more weeks than not. They did give him, rather hysterically, a goal line rush, and that kind of takes us to the sheeshes. Basically, what happened... DeAndre Hopkins has a potential 24-yard touchdown. Wide, wide, wide open. Kyler just completely missed him. 
Next play, fourth down, Kyler picks it up. They get down inside the goal line. They pull up a like jet sweep for Zach Ertz inside the five-yard line. He fumbles as he's getting to the goal line. It looked like they were going to lose the ball. He was ruled down just short. And then Kyler managed to hit the Andre Hopkins for a one-yard touchdown. So it all worked out. Wasn't too big of a shoe situation. Just funny to see how that happened. You know, you got Rondale Moore. You use a second-round pick on Andy Isabella. You know, you got Chase Edmonds, James Conner. Let's, uh, let's get a guy that's been on the team for a week and uh, is known as being a possession tight end a carry inside the five yard line why not whatever good good day for you Zach Ertz clearly I'm um, outperforming some of the expectations myself and others had hey he'll be a top 10 top 12 tight end I think more weeks than not moving forward I still would take Dallas Goddard over Ertz in the long term just because look at this receiving room Ertz Green Hopkins Kirk Rondale Chase Edmonds all these guys have between three and five targets today except for Hopkins with nine so yeah Ertz made the most of them today just realize I don't think we're getting 47 yard touchdowns out of the guy each and every week but either way Another weapon for Kyler. This is a scary Arizona Cardinals offense when everything is humming. Yeah, Hopkins, 53 yards, had the touchdown I mentioned, seven catches. They just haven't needed to really pull out their ace of spades yet and go to Hopkins and give him that true double-digit target workload. Obviously, you know, it's, it was a revenge game for him, but they didn't need to go quite down that well um, just yet in this one. So Hopkins. We need to treat him as more of a borderline wide receiver one just because of the volume concerns. But truly, people, he looks as good as ever. I wouldn't be shocked at all if we see a huge second half resurgence out of the artist known as Nuke. On the Texan side of thing, I really don't have much of anything, people. It was disappointing to see Brandon Cooks only have five catches for 21 yards. But yeah, they continue to use four running backs each and every week. Davis Mills continues to really not provide all that much. I mean, 135 yards on just 32 pass attempts. Credit to him for not throwing a pick and only losing one fumble, but you know, just not really giving them much of a chance to win week in and week out. Quickly uh, with the running back rooms, David Johnson actually played 59% snaps, led the way with seven carries four targets whether or not that's going to stick here moving forward remains to be seen maybe they trade them maybe they trade brandon cooks it'd be great but you know we'll see what happens there mark ingram in second 36 percent snap six carries three targets as we've told you all year the answer to which texans running back to play in fantasy is no with the cardinals Great usage for Chase Edmonds. In a game they won by 26, he had 75% of the snaps, 15 carries and two targets. James Conner, 31% snaps, 10 carries and zero targets. Naturally, James Conner found his way into the end zone on one of them, and it was a good run. He uh, got up and bounced to the outside, and he was eff efficient all day with his opportunities. But the fact that we got to see Edmonds outrush out, excuse me, out carry James Conner 15 to 20, 15 to 10. And, you know, credit to Edmonds gained 81 yards on those 15 carries uh, and also had the nine yard catch. The fact that Edmonds was able to do that this week is huge because he's been playing through the shoulder injury. And last week when the Cardinals got up, they legitimately just didn't give Chase Edmonds any work in the second half. So Edmonds, despite him not having a freaking touchdown all year, despite Conner being the biggest vulture we know in 2021, he's still been putting forward Borderline, if not low end, RB2 value, fully thanks to his pass catching role. So, Edmonds, now that he's back to being the lead rusher of the group as well, we can get back to starting him each and every week with confidence. You know, a couple weeks ago, I before the shoulder injury, I named Chase Edmonds as my single favorite by low running back in fantasy football. And I still think the point stands. Like he is someone you can start each and every week with confidence. And God forbid James Conner, who as we know, hasn't exactly been able to stay all that healthy throughout his career, except for at the moment right now. If Conner goes down, we're looking at a true 80, 90% plus role for Chase Edmonds. And we just don't see those in fantasy football. Great stuff from Edmonds. Again, mentioned the uh, Kyler near injury, but seems to be okay, which takes us to our PFF Lily stat, which I kind of just mentioned. But yeah, Chase Edmonds, people, league high, 95 touches and zero touchdowns. We have Miles Sanders, who I think after today is at like 81 touches and zero touchdowns. Going into this week, nobody else was at even like 40 touches and zero scores. So it truly has been an anomaly with Edmonds. They gave him a carry inside the five-yard line today. I think they realized that one of their, you know, better producers. Just I'm not saying he's better than Nuke or Rondale Moore or anyone, but just statistically, one of their better producers, one of the guys that touches the ball most in this offense. I think Kingsbury and company know that uh, he's someone they want to get more involved moving forward and just get him into the end zone. So continue to start Edmonds in any league where you get a full point per reception and just realize his upside remains through the roof if uh, anything happens to James Conner. 
final game here. Thank you, as always, for sticking with me. We had the Buccaneers massacre the Bears 38-3. to Tampa Bay easily covered as a 12.5-point favorite. The under cashed at 47. So, yeah, Tom Brady, uh, you know, four. We all remember the meme. Four first half touchdowns for uh, the Goats. So Tom Brady just goes ahead and, you know, maybe the one flaw from his 2020 season, which was just more funny than anything. Now he can come back and say, yeah, I went against that defense next year. And yeah, I, I have my four fingers up for the four touchdowns I threw against you in the first half. Three of them went to Mike Evans. One of them went to Chris Goblin. Goblin should have not should have. He could have had another touchdown late in the second half. Down the seam for 34 yards. He reached out for the end zone. Just couldn't quite get in there. So we're not complaining. Eight catches, 111 yards, and that score. Just realized inches away from adding a second one uh, to his plate. O.J. Howard could have had a touchdown. He was wide the hell open, but worst miss of the day from Brady. Just sailed it out the back of the end zone. So Howard, you know, wasn't someone that we were too overly touting this week just because we still have Cambrai and you still have all those receivers that the ball is going through first and foremost ultimately only had three targets caught one for nine yards so it seems like Gronk is getting closer and closer to returning uh, either way Howard's not going to be anything really more than a touchdown dependent tight end too as long as Gronk remains sidelined uh, how the mighty have fallen I'm old enough to remember when Howard was like being ranked as a top five tight end going into seasons I know it's his first year coming off the Achilles it's great he is already uh Back on the field, uh, just wild to see kind of where he was two years ago uh, versus at this second. So, yeah, Mike Evans, not one, not two, but three first half touchdowns. I thought it was pretty cool when he catches a 46 yard pass down the sideline. Brady goes right back to him the next play on a fade for the touchdown uh, to not leave his guy hanging uh, just short of the goal line. So, Brady's out there. He knows he doesn't want his guys to get sheeshed. He made it happen. So, just, yeah, great game from these Tampa Bay uh, receivers in general. Bears receivers didn't have much of a chance because Justin Fields was, what's the right word? We've already used horrendous a lot. Let's go with atrocious here. Might have used that already too, but whatever. 184 yards, three picks, no touchdowns on 32 attempts. Also took four sacks. QBR, which is on a 0 to 100 scale, 1.9. Tom Brady was a 93.1. Yeah, that's not very good, people. Also fumbled three times, lost two of them. It was just bad, and it's a mix of Fields and Nagy and everyone else. I mean, this Bears offense is just a train wreck at this point, and it was kind of, we could have seen it coming. Again, every Monday, and you can find it on pff.com on Tuesday, I write my quarterback predictions piece, and I'm not you know, pulling this out saying, look how smart I am. Believe me, you can go look at last week's, and I'm sure plenty of them you know, were proved to be incorrect. But for Fields, the issue going in this matchup was pressure because he has been the single worst quarterback in the league this year under pressure. Part of that has been him holding the ball too long. But when we have these guys, and it was the same thing with Teddy Bridgewater um, against the Browns on Thursday night, why I wasn't very high on him as a potential streamer or Tim Patrick or any of these guys. You might have a decent enough matchup in the secondary, but if we have a quarterback that is prone to holding the ball long and they're not playing great when they are pressured, it's just going to be hard to expect them to take advantage of these theoretical positive matchups on the outside. So Cole Komet had five catches for 43 yards. Khalil Herbert, five catches, 33 yards. Nobody else more than three catches. Allen Robinson, two catches, 16 yards. Darnell Mooney, two catches for 39 yards. Just really, everyone other than Khalil Herbert looked pretty damn bad for the Bears in this one. Herbert, 100 rushing yards, and again, chipped in the receiving yards, and people, this usage, it's the Khalil Herbert show without David Montgomery, and once Montgomery comes back, I think Herbert's playing well enough to probably be the number two and maybe make this a little bit more of a timeshare than we saw, because in this one, with Damian Williams back off the COVID list, oh my goodness, people, 85% snaps for Khalil Herbert. He had 18 carries. Damian Williams had just three. Three targets for Khalil, just one for Dame. So the fact that Damian Williams only played 16% of the offensive snaps, maybe this was something about him just first game back from COVID. They wanted to test his conditioning. But when you have your rookie playing this well, and really you just continue to feature him over Damian Williams, I don't think Williams has earned like that, earned the benefit of the doubt in getting his job back. I mean, he did miss the time. Not sitting here trying to make a political statement, but he was unvaccinated when he missed the time with COVID. I think it would make sense if the coaching staff like hold that against him a little bit and they give Khalil the job because more than anything, he has performed better with the opportunity. So 
Whatever caused Damian Williams to fall to number three, seemingly on the depth chart, I do believe that has taken place. Again, 85% to 16%, that is just true workhorse stuff. This does not show me any signs that Damian Williams is going to have a fantasy viable role moving forward. And he's not going to be a recommended start as early as the Bears' next game because we can't get behind someone that just had four combined carries and targets in this game. So Khalil Herbert with this usage, probably not true RB1, but pretty damn close people. We're going to be hard-pressed to rank more than 14, 15 guys ahead of him. It's just kind of like the Devontae Booker thing. So I think Herbert's better than Devontae Booker, and he's proved that. The fact that he had this much success against the Buccaneers, arguably league best front seven, particularly their rush defense, is incredibly impressive. And like Booker, like when we have someone guaranteed 15 plus touches on an 80% snap rate, we just need to start them every single week. So I think if you have Herbert, you're starting him no matter what and feeling great about it i'm just you know think about it i gotta rank every player throughout the week i'm always just kind of thinking more in the whole uh running back uh land scheme of things so with that in mind herbert at worst upside rb2 moving forward everyone else in the bears offense cutting Allen robinson just feels so weird but at this point it, it just hurts people so I would try, I guess, to hold on to A-Rob. I don't know how someone that's been this good for this long can continue to suck like this. But, hey, bye weeks can really suck sometimes. At this point, the only guy that should be started on a weekly basis inside the Chicago offense is Khalil Herbert until Dave Montgomery gets back. Make sure you keep an eye on Tariq Cohen's status. Haven't heard anything to really I give us a big idea that he'll be back sooner rather than later, but he is at least eligible to be activated off the pup now that we have gotten past those first six weeks. With the Buccaneers, Leonard Fournette, 56% snaps, 15 carries, 4 targets. He did find his way into the end zone once on the ground and ended up totaling 91 total yards for himself. So Fournette continues to look pretty good out there. I think we just kind of need to remove that negative stigma that was around him towards the end of his Jaguars tenure and realize he is now the pretty much undisputed RB1. We still got Giovanni Bernard taking some targets, Ronald Jones siphoning away some you know garbage time work and a few early down carries here or there. Not the complete undisputed workhorse, but when you're in an offense that can score 30 plus on anyone, you know, we don't need to have that 80, 90% snap rate to see a lot of good things happen. So Leonard Fournette, every week RB1 at this point, you should be feeling great if you got him around that RB30 range where he was being drafted back in August. I mentioned the Howard and Goblin Shishas. Uh, Fields maybe could have had a touchdown to Jesper Horstead, uh, three, three touchdowns in a preseason game. It's the very same guy, Jesper Horstead, went off his fingertips. I tend to blame that one a little bit more on Fields, but maybe if you're trying to be a dick, you could say Horstead uh, could have come down with it. So those are the big takeaways. And finally, our PFF Lily stat. Tom Brady on pace this year for a cool 51 touchdowns, another two rushing scores versus just seven interceptions. Like there's Dak, there's Kyler, there's Lamar. But at the end of the day, people, I think Tom Brady is continuing to make one hell of a case for MVP. So that's going to wrap up our game by game breakdowns. I'm just kind of quickly uh, looking through some stuff that has happened while I've been podcasting. I'm not seeing any huge injury updates. So at this point, I think we are good to go, people. Make sure you check out the Tuesday edition of the PFF Fantasy Football Podcast. I'll be back here with Dwayne McFarland breaking down all your waiver wire needs. Dwayne and I are back on Wednesday to preview the upcoming week's games. Thursday, I have a guest on more weeks than not. Friday, I break down the DFS slate with my buddy Andrew Erickson of PFF. And then Andrew, myself, and usually Dwayne will again meet on Friday evening live. So if you want to check us out, we usually record between 4 and 5 p.m. Live on StreamYard. Tweet it out from the PFF account. I'll retweet it. We go through all the injury updates because, you know, especially if you're a DFS player out there, you know how like one injury can, as a Peter Overset would put it, flip the entire slate on his head. So we try to wrap that up at the end of each and every week. So thank you again for tuning in to PFF Fantasy Football Podcast. I'm Ian Harditz. You can find me on Twitter at iHarditz. Just trying to, you know, Help you be a better fantasy football player, make some money, have some fun. So I love football and I love that all you tune in. So as always, thank you. And until next time, take care, everybody.